I'd like to cover four things uh, and answer these questions. How do we get here? What's the problem? What is single payer? And what can we do? So over the next 22 minutes or so, I hope to uh, answer some of these questions. So if we go back, I think the turning point for this current system is after World War II. Uh, we basically had wage fixing, and companies were looking for ways to attract the, the best and brightest minds to their uh, organizations. And they found that, hey, let's start paying for single health. And so that really uh, was when um, employer-driven health care and insurance started. And in the 60s, you know, private insurance said, hey, we can do a great job. And, you know, we're going to do such a good job that we're going to have universal health care in 10 years. And, you know, and we know how well that worked out, right? So, and then the, in the 80s, this fundamental shift occurred to private investor-owned health care corporations. And so this is, the, this is the beginning of the end here. These are the, you know, uh, profit-driven companies who are out there exclusively to provide uh, return on investment for their investors and have fiduciary responsibility to them and not to human beings. Uh, healthcare was perceived as this fertile field for profit seeking. And this is where health healthcare became a commodity and patients became consumers. And they're continually trying to tell us this. So what is the problem? How big is it? How do we quantify it? It's 18% of the U.S. gross domestic product. It's giant. Agriculture represents 1.2%. And surprisingly and enough, defense is only 9%. 8 to 9%. So we, can, we, have, we, have to, you know, we pay twice as much as it costs for us to go around the world and start wars and be world police. That's huge. We pay more than $8,600 per person a year. So this is a bit of a busy graph, but basically what it shows is that we spend more than two times per person per year in our health care than most other industrialized nations do, those other countries that we like to compare ourselves to. If you look at the overhead, which is a major problem in our current system, investor-owned uh, businesses and private insurance companies uh, have about a 26.5% overhead uh, due to administrative costs, marketing, sales, uh, $100 million, uh, you know, ivory tower buildings, advertising, advertising. Medicare which has high customer service satisfaction, is 3.1%. So there's an, en an enormous obstacle between the human being and their, pr their primary care provider, and that's insurance. And they suck the life out of the process and all the money with it. So uh, if you say that we're going to quantify and put a number of 31%, that's $399 billion. Canada spends 17. Um, there's potential savings of uh, $286 billion. That's enough to cover the uninsured and then some. If you look at the cost of uh, the Patient Protection uh, and Affordable Care Act, funding that alone is probably around $100 billion. So you can tell, uh, although it's a, a second-rate plan, um, cutting this out alone would be more than enough to pay for it. So how do we pay for it? Well, your traditional Medicare, Medicaid, VA, et cetera, is 34%. State and local governments uh, pay about 13%. Uh, private insurance is about 34%, but out-of-pocket, 12%. So we're paying for uh, of 12% of $2.6 trillion out-of-pocket. This graph shows uh, the ad annual uh, medical costs uh, for a family of four. And, you know, we're paying almost $20,000 a year currently for our health care, whether, you know, we think we're paying for it or not. You know, we may think that, oh, no, my insurance, you know, takes care of it. But, no, you know, that money that your 
employer is paying for your insurance. You're paying for that. That's your money, and you're spending that much. So this is the uh, slide that I mentioned. Uh, it shows income and premiums. So, you know, I hope the insurance company sees the writing on the wall because, you know what, they are uh, increasing the cost of the premiums more than ever. I think they see, I hope they see the writing on the wall, and that's why they're doing this. They're trying to make as much profit as possible now because they know they're going to be out of business one of these days. And if you keep it up at this rate, it's unsustainable. At 2025, our insurance premiums would cost more than we make a year. So back to this other problem, the spending, the overhead, administrators, wow. Uh, the rate of growth of these administrators is just uh, outrageous. Uh, and you know, the, the physicians is flat, and so are nursing, uh, which is arguably more important. Is this the numbers of, or the earnings of? The numbers of, the numbers of. yep. Uh, so what do, what do these administrators do? Uh, they do a lot of stuff, including cost shifting. Uh, this is the reason why we've got the $5 aspirin in the ER. You know, so if anybody gets chest pain, whatever you do, take your aspirin at home before you go to the hospital. Okay? It's, you know, and sent, especially if you want to look at the fact that an uh, aspirin tablet is more important than uh, in your survivability and whether you're going to live or you're going to have congestive heart failure or how you're going to do, it's more important than being flown to a tertiary care center and getting cardiac catheterization. If you were to choose one of the two, you would choose aspirin. More important. So what do we get for all this spending? Well, another kind of busy graph which basically shows that we spend a lot and we get very little. So best health care to the right, worst health care to the left, spending uh, along the x-axis. So we do very poorly. So how do we measure ourselves against our, the other industrialized nations? Well, one thing is we look at life expectancy. So U.S. 77.1, Japan 81.5. Italy, 79.9. If you want to look at the, how many of uh, the percentage of people smoking, it also goes up to the right. So, you know, we have people, you know, significantly higher numbers of people smoking in these other countries, but still they have longer life expectancy. So, yeah, we're right, right after, uh, 27th, right after Barbados. Okay. Infant mortality per 1,000 births. That kind of says it all. We're ranked 36 below Cuba and Taiwan. Physician visits per capita. We don't go to the doctor. Other places go to the doctor. Yeah, and, and if, even if we have insurance, then, you know, then it's, there's going to be a huge out-of-pocket expense. There is, we're disincentivized to go to the doctor. Highest number of preventable deaths among this group of industrialized nations. You know, our signs say 45 to 50,000 Americans die each year for lack of health care. Uh, there's a new study out that suggests it's much closer to 100,000. So, the uninsured, 51 million Americans. And, you know, you know we, it'd be really easy if we could just say, hey, get a job, you know? <laughs> Well, that's a much bigger, more difficult story. But you know what? If you said that, 66.5% of them would say, I have a job. So the unsustainable cycle. Put yourself in this circle anywhere. You can find yourself. These are all options, and they all affect us at different times. So uh, increased illness and disability. You need insurance premiums. But you've got these diseases, so the insurance premiums go up. Uh, your choice for uh, these policies is fewer and fewer, and the only thing that makes economic sense for somebody is to buy insurance policies with very high deductibles. So you do that, increase out-of-pocket spending. But you know what? You don't have any money, and you, know, you, you don't have a hot water heater, and your kid really wants to go to summer camp, and all of these other things that uh, come into life. Decrease use of health services. Well, you start getting sick, you can't go to work. You get sicker. 
and you're uninsured. So this is an unsustainable cycle, and this is stuff, this is real, and this happens to all of us. So when we go bankrupt, we go bankrupt um, for the number one reason of uh, medical costs. A million people a year in the United States are going bankrupt. So what is the problem? It's the insurance companies. They're expensive. We get poor outcomes. They're crappy products. They're increasing disparities among uh, people. It drives this concept of regressive taxation. Uh, we have you know, increasing preventable deaths. We're losing doctors. Um, and we have so many underinsured and uninsured people. This is the problem. It's a market failure. We need socialized uh, medical insurance with private medical delivery. So what is single payer? Uh, this is you know, um, another big question. It's a unified risk pool. It's a concept of everybody in, nobody out. This includes undocumented uh, workers, uh, illegal aliens, anybody who happens to be in your country visiting, everybody. It's inclusive, it's not exclusive. Uh, everybody contributes to the fund on their ability to pay. It's a true progressive tax, not a regressive tax where the poor are the ones who ultimately pay. They may not pay uh, with dollars, but they're going to pay in the quality of their life, um, their rela relationships, and how long they live. Uh, all medically necessary care is covered in a system of single payer. So, if you need a liver transplant, you get it. Uh, there will always be some health care rationing uh, based on the overall ability for our society to, uh, to pay and deliver care. But for all medically necessary procedures, it's included. Simplified administration saves enormous amount of money can save hundreds of billions of dollars a year, more than enough right now in the system to pay for universal health care for all. You get a choice of physicians and treatment with a privatized uh, uh, public, sorry, with a public insurance and a private delivery, you get to choose your physicians. They can compete uh, for your business based on quality. If they advertise, I've got the best nurses, I've got the best facilities, we have the lowest incidence of, of infection at our facility, you're going to go to them. And they're going to try, they're going to do these quality measures to get you to come to them and allow them to provide service. It's a win-win situation. Uh, focus on preventative and timely care. Right? We need people going to the primary care doctor. We need doctors doing real physical exams. We need hands on patients to find disease uh, and to take steps early and to prevent death. Uh, and, and we need this uh, history and physical paid by a primary care physician to do this. We cannot rely on the medical device industry and the pharmaceutical industry to do this for us. Talk about blockbuster drugs. Other than Lipitor, I can't think of another truly blockbuster drug, period. Tell me, give me the name of a good antibiotic that's a blockbuster drug, makes more than a billion dollars a year and really helps somebody. The last time we've had a blockbuster drug was oral birth control pills in 1957. Transparency and accountability to the public, okay? There is no transparency in the system. People come in to me all the time with a cut on their finger and say, how much is this going to cost? And I generally say, I have no idea and I'm sorry. But you know what else I do half the time is I say, are you a hand model? Or you know, are you a concert uh, pianist? If you're not, you know what? It's going to heal. Go away. Go home. Clean it up. It's because it's going to cost $1,500 now that I've learned for your typical laceration on the finger. All right? So anyway. Uh, Google it. Um, sew it up yourself. Do something. <laughs> so funding uh, for the National Health uh, Program. So 
source of revenue over here on the left. Medicaid, Medicare, state and local governments, employers, pri private insurance revenues, new taxes, into the system, uh, into the fund, and then it pays hospitals, uh, capital equipment, global operating budgets like Dr. Flowers talked about, um, HMOs who's ha who have delivery wings, so take Kaiser for example, they are both insurance and delivery, but they do a good job in delivery. So let's keep that organization together. They do a good, good job of seeing patients, taking care of patients, and that part of their business can still operate. Uh, Fee-for-service physicians, home health care agencies, and you want to talk about job growth. Man, this is a prime for small business, uh, for increasing the number of uh, home health care agencies. Um, and, uh, you know, you could create hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs that way. And long-term care as well. Uh, so if you do the math, you know, and these numbers aren't necessarily designed to line up with any other numbers that we talked about, right? These are sort of an independent analysis. There are additional costs to cover the uninsured and poorly insured. Um, the elimination of cost sharing and co-pays. So every time you go to the doctor and give them 20 bucks, that $20 is gone now. So it's going to cost a little bit more to make up for that. But the savings in bulk purchasing, uh, administrative costs, uh, physician office costs, which are just gigantic to hire many, many people to be on the phone and the computer all day dealing with the 700 to 1,400 insurance companies and their 50 products each. You get rid of that. Uh, and then getting rid of some fraud um, and uh, the net savings is about 4.3%. Um, so, you know, with our current system alone, uh, you know, we can pay for this. So, uh, where's single payer? Um, there are a lot of state efforts. Uh, you, we've, you just heard a discussion of where a lot of the states are. Um, the uh, the um, PPACA, the Patient Protection and uh, Affordable Care Act is, I think, a uh, second-rate plan that's put a uh, sort of an iron um, in, the, um, in the process of states doing their own single-payer systems. We have to wait for waivers. We have to do all kinds of things. We have to spend a lot of money in the meantime, um, creating uh, insurance exchanges, et cetera. But uh, each state you know, needs to build coalition, to push for, for state le legislation uh, for single payer or some type of hybrid of single payer. So 20 states are doing it. It's growing all the time. So what can we do? Well, we're here. It's all about education, right? So you got to teach yourself. You got to teach your children. You got to teach your neighbors, your colleagues. Uh, you got to build coalitions. I uh, reach out to, uh, to grassroots uh, organizations and be part of them. Um, and advocating for social justice and economic justice. This is important, and this is um, a lot of what you know, we the people and uh, what Kevin Zeese talked about. So we need to put pressure on insurance co companies, right? We need to look at our portfolios. We need to call our 401k, if we're lucky enough to have one, call our 401k advisor and, and ask them about what we can do to have an investment portfolio that is free of these types of companies. When we need to expose health injustice, uh, when hospitals are closing, we need to do something about it. When we have friends who are denied care, we need to help them, we need to buoy them, we need to make phone calls. Um, and Again, what do we do kind of in the state of where is healthcare reform, you know, on a, on a national level? Well, I think we have an imperfect plan. There are some good parts about it. Um, you know, the, the Supreme Court is uh, taking this issue up of constitutionality, uh, primarily of, of the mandate uh, to uh, have everybody buy private insurance. 
Um, they're going to take that up in March, and they're hopefully going to make a decision uh, by late summer before the, the fall election. Um, I'm really ambivalent about what the right thing to do is. I, it, it's inspired me to, to find out about our Constitution. Um, I didn't really know anything about it before. I think I missed that day of high school. And, you know, I'm, uh, in some ways I'm hoping that they find it unconstitutional. Um, you know, there are some great things about it, and I think it's a historic moment, but I, we need a national, the, you know, developing state single-payer systems or tri-payer uh, tri systems are going to be helpful and may ultimately be what we have to do, but we need a national health care ser service. We need <coughs> national health care. Uh, and the reform uh, really falls short. It's going to leave probably about 30 million people uninsured. It is not universal health care by any uh, means. Uh, there's, it's going to increase total health spending. It's empowering the insurance industry. Um, and it s severely restricts choice. So what can you do? Study, understand the problem, educate yourself and friends, consider so solutions, think about short-term, long-term solutions, and persuade and motivate yourself, your family, and your friends. So we talked about how we got here, what the problem is, what is single payer, and what can we do. Any questions? Uh, I am for um, health care as a human right, and I am for a constitutional amendment in Oregon for health care as a human right. We're under considerable time constraint for the 2012 uh, session. It seems that we are almost up, up against overwhelming odds to do the proper paperwork and to get uh, 123,350 signatures by July 6th. But I think it's, it, it's critically important. I mean, you know, if you don't do it now, it's going to be a couple of years. Another couple of years is going to go by. And I think that Oregonians will look, you know, kind of uh, feckless. You know, we, we need to do something and we need to be empowered. We need to work uh, towards uh, something like healthcare as a human right. And I think it's critically important because it sets the stage for the second round, which is to have meaningful long term health care reform. We have a massive shortage of primary care physicians. We have a massive shortage of primary care providers, which I would say are what we now call so-called mid-levels, physician's assistants and, and uh, nurse practitioners. You know, you get a lot of boom for the buck uh, with mid-level providers. They're highly skilled, trained, you know, people who can see large volumes of people efficiently and provide fantastic care. So we need primary care doctors and we need more so-called mid-level providers. So if you look at a lot of entrepreneurial physician groups, you know, they don't hire physicians. They hire mid-level providers. You know, you know, why hire somebody at uh, $200,000 a year when you can hire somebody for $90,000 a year and, and, you know, in certain circumstances um, get the identical or better care? When you talk about fraud, you know, we, we, it was interesting to hear Mark Frowers and, and uh, Kevin uh, Zies talk about the insurance companies. Because really, you know, and in this little talk, we've sort of said that they are unnecessary, that they are um, expensive and don't provide a good product, but they are also fraudulent. They are criminal. You know, you go to the Department of Justice website and look at how many criminal lawsuits have been thrown at the insurance industry. It is outrageous. And we're talking billions and billions of dollars that they have knowingly stolen from the system. And so fraud, is, it's interesting that it's a kind of a unique phenomenon that the federal government is interested in. Uh, but, oh, my gosh, you know, the insurance companies uh, are, you know, and I, I try not to paint uh, things in moral context, but, man, they are evil. And, yeah. You know, as this society, we realize that there's always going to be a safety net of people um, who... We have to make a choice as a society that we're willing to embrace these people uh, and to provide care for them because we're doing it now anyway, and, but we're doing it in a very expensive way. Um, you know, emergency department uh, and salvage care is very expensive. So 
Uh, and these, you know, these undocumented people, uh, workers, et cetera, are very important to our economy. Just a, a comment on, on the, quote, freeloading aspect of, of uh, single payer. If you consider all those who would fall in the same category right now who are freeloading in, uh, in this $1,500 a head emergency room, that uh, no, will no longer have to be there. Just the savings on that would pay for them. In addition to which, you've got all kinds of people who are outside the system or off the grid or whatever you want to call it, who might come back in off the grid if the grid was working properly, which this would. So I think those are two parts of that. Well, answer. Mark, you know, you made me think too is that, you know, uh, I think the real freeloaders uh, are the most wealthy people in America. You know, this is a regressive tax. So the people who make very little money are the ones who are paying. The, you know, the family that Kevin Zeese described of, you know, six uh, people um, from the, what's the name of that family? Walton. Yeah, Walton's, you know, who own 20% of the assets of the United States. Those are, yeah, 30, those are the people who are freeloading. Just another quick comment. Uh -huh. A lot of people think the, the just malingerers are a terrific problem in this country. It's not true. It's just not true. Uh, the, the true malingerer is probably 1% of, of, of the patient population that we see as physicians. The, tr the true malingerer, the intentional malingerer. And I think the, true, the, the same thing can be said about the, uh, the freeloaders. I think we, we, we exaggerate that problem. I think we absolutely exaggerate that problem because we're so goddamn paranoid. Yeah, and the, the emergency medicine, emergency medicine literature is very interesting. You know, we, we thought forever that the malingerers, freeloaders, and the uninsured were the problem in emergency departments. All three of those groups found absolutely not to be true. Thanks a lot for that comment. Thank you.